So I had an opportunity to talk to Ben and just get a little bit of a context about what um, where folks are at in terms of uh, learning and and about Buddhism. And what I said to him is that I thought maybe it would be helpful, like the books will take care of traditional and, uh, Buddhism, that you can, there's, there's plenty of books that have been written about it, and what I might be more useful for is to just give a little bit of an overview of the, what I think is a pretty um, important and exciting moment that we are in, which there's a significant transition, I think, maybe for the first time we're starting to feel our way into what might be an American Buddhism. And the way that I'll get to that is to just say that um, some of you might know, you know, Buddhism has come from many different countries, right? And so what we have here is for the first time in history, uh, a place in which there are people from and lineage holders, right? People that have carried the teachings forward from their traditions for hundreds and sometimes over a thousand, over two thousand, up to two thousand years, are all in one place. They're all in one land mass, and that's never been seen before. That's pretty unprecedented, and a lot of, um, we don't actually talk about that a lot and talk about what that means. It's kind of like a mashup, right? It's, you've got uh, these not only different traditions, but you have whole different lineages, whole different cultures, all in one place. So you have Japanese cultures and the, all of the traditions and lineages that have come from there, Chinese, Indian, uh, all of the South Asian, Vietnamese, Sri Lankan, uh, Tibetan, you know, there's just a plethora of different traditions and they're finding themselves not only on one land mass, but oftentimes now we're seeing people um, show up and, you know, as we're Americans, right, we go around and we shop. And so we're, sh we get to shop at different locations and places and, you know, it's sort of like the, um, going to the Buddhist mall here. Because you can go from one place to another in a way that was just not possible. You might get a little bit of divergence at different times in history where there was one teacher teaching one kind of style and maybe another teacher emphasized something different or there might be you know what they call like the the lineages and so there are different emphases in those lineages but what we have here is uh, kind of like Burger King and McDonald's and Wendy's and you can choose from any of those things and you can go back and forth and get your fries from here, your shake from there, your burger from there, and if you're vegetarian, you know, there are places to go for that as well. So we're seeing something that is unprecedented in terms of the Buddhist landscape and, and history. And that's very um, disturbing, I think, for, for people in some ways because there's a sense of, um, as it, it, it makes sense, coming from mother countries, many people want to keep a kind of purity Right? And, but purity in the Buddhist tradition and Buddhist history is a myth. It has, it has never been pure in any sense. It has always, in fact, that's been its, its, its most stunning characteristic, is that it has morphed. Buddhism, as it has entered into different countries and different times, has morphed and taken on the culture and the tone and the feeling and the colors and the style of whatever place it, it landed in. There would be some kind of a person, there would be a person and persons that would bridge from one place to another. But still, it would just take on a different flavor. And so it's always been the kind of tradition that finds itself um, very true to its teaching, really meeting people where they are. And you've gotten to hear, um, um, as I understand, some of the core teachings that carry through it. So for instance, the Four Noble Truths are one of the core teachings that it's kind of like, you're not a Buddhist if you don't, if you don't kind of <laughs> you know, connect with, with that, that basic teaching. But other than that, it's kind of all up for grabs. And uh, different, there are people that focus on meditation, and in this country in particular, what I want to call, it's not the best term, but it makes, it, it helps us understand what we're saying. Uh, Western convert Buddhists tend to focus more on meditation than is actually focused on in the mother countries themselves. There tends to be more mass Buddhist uh, participation in other countries where 
people um, that are Buddhist and born into Buddhists are more devotional Buddhists. And so they go to what would be like for us in a Judeo-Christian society. They go to church, they go to temple, they, they do it once a week, they show up at ceremonies, they invite the clergy to, into their lives for particular life transitions. Uh, Buddhists are kind of famous for their, for their death ceremonies. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's different here, is really what I want to get at, than what we might think of um, or we might get exposed to as you will learn about Buddhism throughout the course of your, your coming year and your, your coming semester. And, and that's a good thing because it, it is unlikely to alter the mother traditions in such a way that it dilutes them. But at the same time, especially at this time in society, it's important that many of the, the different traditions actually learn to be able to be responsive to the needs of people and society in the moment that they, they, they find them. And so Buddhism has kind of um, grown up through this a first generation of, you basically had like largely Asian, Asian um, teachers that were brought over or came over through a first generation of American teachers. And now there's a changing of the guard that's happening based on the ages of those first generation American teachers. Um, their ages, just they're, they're, they're starting to have, you know, they're having babies. And so I, for instance, represent one of those second generation Americans. Some of us, many of us whom have never actually stayed in the mother countries for any reasonable period of time. I mean, I was there in Japan for some time, but, but nothing, nothing I could call more than really being a tourist. Um, and so my Buddhist leanings are as affected by hip hop and um, American culture and growing up in New York City as it is by the bowing and text and sutras and what the ceremonies are. So all of those things are wrapped up in how I actually express and teach and what is important to me so that the essence of the teaching kind of runs through each generation. But I think appropriately so as human beings, what we're doing is we're finding the the heart of what is actually going to speak to us while keeping the essence of the teachings intact. And so my um, uh, uh, existence is an, is, or is an anomaly in the Buddhist landscape because there are very few black uh, uh, teachers, lineage holders in the Buddhist traditions and that's the result of Buddhism finding itself in this country at a time when civil rights hadn't fully taken hold and as we know for socioeconomic reasons and class reasons and just the history of this country in context, many people of color, immigrants um, and black people have been sort of on the back burner. But now that's changing and many people having moved past a sense of just needing to quote unquote survive are able to separate from, or maybe they never even grew up as I, as I didn't, with a close relationship with their historic religious roots. And so we feel more free to explore. And that's creating a kind of explosion in contemporary Buddhism of, very, of a very different look. For the first time, you have a lot of queer Dharma. You have a lot of LGBT folks coming into Dharma. You have a lot of people that are um, practicing Pretty, pretty regularly across traditions. So there's, there's like the, the earliest schools, the middle schools, and, and what would one, one would call maybe the, um, um, the, they call it Vajrayana, the expedient schools. And some people actually practice in all those traditions. When you take that and you meet, have it meet American consumerism, and we've got magazines, right? That that's something that exists and that we're uniquely bringing. We have a whole, essentially a whole Buddhist media. And a, the thing that America's probably most famous for and most prolific at is marketing. And so we, even though Buddhists tend to say they don't proselytize, I always say, but we advertise. 
And so we have a very different shaping that's happening in terms of what Buddhism, the Buddhism that you will learn about in the books is on the street, so to speak, a different animal that, than what's actually showing up. What that means is that, as I'm sure is true for many of you, each of us are finding our own way into trying to express these core teachings of recognizing that the nature of human life is that we suffer. That we, not in a, like, oh, your, your life is suffering and so, you know, go crawl in a hole and pull it in after you, but rather, this is what we experience, that we're often running up against um, certain realities that we either pull away from or we gravitate towards, never quite feeling comfortable just with things as they are, and the result of that is that we experience suffering. We're, we want after things, we want th when we love things and we appreciate them, we want them to stay exactly the way they are. When we don't like things, even little things like the way that the weather is, we wish it would go away and we wish it would be different. And what's essential in the basic understanding of all Buddhist teaching is that that inclination of human, of human existence creates for us the experience of suffering. It's not that the things themselves are suffering, it's that we relate to them in a way that causes us suffering. And so all of the traditions are basically trying to get us to what they would call wake up, right, to reality just as it is for us to actually face reality and to abide in a state and abide in a way to approach our lives in a way that is less about how can I change this and more about how can I be with this. Now, I, I use that word change very specifically because at the same time, we're at a time in society where it's very clear due to inequity, injustice, imbalance, war, um, the way in which there, is, there are divisions amongst people, that change is simultaneously something that we want. And so for many of us, what we're really trying to navigate is what is that balance between the Buddhist concept of being with what is, right, to develop a deep sense of peace and equanimity, and really like, I'm okay with that, at the same time being able to really face the challenges that exist in society, not the least of which is our disruption of our own, our own planet and our pot potential to exist on the planet through climate change, right? And so we have this, what might seem like a paradox in terms of like, why would you do this thing that's about sitting there, being peaceful, being with what is, and at the same time, wanting to be, be a person that changes the world. I mean, that's the central question that exists for me. And I want to uh, talk a little bit about that in terms of unpacking it, because I think like most truths that are really true, as in capital T true, that there is a paradox, and that, and that the paradox is that learning to be with what is really coming to a place in which in my own life I could actually confront the reality of what I was experiencing, and I'll give some ideas about what I was experiencing as I came to Buddhism, actually inspired, was, was what really inspired me to be able to go forth and bring about change. So it's this paradox, like learning to be with what, it, with what is was the very thing that not only inspired me, but empowered me and feels generative in terms of trying to address the challenges uh, fiercely that exist in the world, trying to ad address injustice and to speak to injustice, including within Buddhist communities because there's a great deal of imbalance that still exists within contemporary Buddhist communities. So I um, grew up if I ever grew up, I'm still working on that. Um, I grew up in a mixed race family and uh, part of my history was Baptist. I got to wear a, um, you know, paper doilies on my head and patent leather shoes and go to church and be in the choir. 
And it just was one of those things that for whatever reason it didn't fit. I would pour through the Bible and I really appreciated the teachings, but what I saw as the teachings and what I experienced out in the world in church didn't exactly match up. And so I had this tenuous relationship with church and by the time I was 12 I declared myself agnostic and I always say I was agnostic rather than atheist because I wasn't quite courageous enough just in case you know there was somebody up there that was going to get mad that I said I was that I said I was atheist and so I existed in my life my life was one of really um, orienting towards evolution theory science I had a sort of disdain for people that were spiritual. I thought, well, you know, you seem nice enough, but you're religious, and so you can't quite possibly be that smart. Like, that was actually the attitude that I really moved through life with, that I didn't really trust people that took things at face value, and that had w what we called faith. I, didn't, I just didn't trust it. I thought that that didn't make any sense, because if you couldn't, have evidence of the thing in front of you, how could you possibly believe it? Well, as it turns out, Buddhism, or is, and Zen Buddhism in particular, was perfect for that because there's not a lot of inclination towards belief in the Western version of Buddhism. So what I stumbled onto was a kind of um, super stripped down philosophy more than a set of beliefs that I snuck in the back door of. And I snuck in that back door, as many of us do, um, when I was at a point in, in which we, we, we generally arrive there when we want to make sense of life. And I started to look through Buddhist books and Zen books, mostly because I was interested in the aesthetic. It was f finally a way in which I could get out of the clutter of my mom's house. <laughs> And Zen aesthetic was very spare. There wasn't a lot of stuff. And so for me, it was a relief just in the aesthetic sense. And at the same time, the, what I was reading about it at the time appealed to my sense of evidence. Like, oh, that's right. I could test that out right away. I could say, yeah, I'm sitting here. I feel uncomfortable and irritable because it's warm. But actually, if I just get curious about the fact that it's warm, it changes, right? And so I had this early sense of, oh, what I think is my experience is not the experience, it's just my experience. <coughs> and the Buddhist teachings are kind of pointing you towards that, right? That to really recognize we have, we are constantly moving around in this subjective state of experience and then we name it the experience, right? And then we fight everybody else about it, or we suffer because of it, or we feel deeply disconnected and at odds with our own reality because we have this l limited view. And when I say limited, I mean it's just limited to our own capacities, our own beliefs, our own upbringing, our own culture. But when we relaxed, into just being with what was in front of us, using our eyes, our ears, our nose, and we all know that even those things are limited. We kind of make up what we want to see and hear what we want to hear and cut out things that don't work for us. But as much as is possible within our own capacity, that when we would just relax, if we could relax into just being with the experience as it was, suddenly the low-level, constant sense of irritation and frustration would drop. Maybe for like three seconds, but it would drop nonetheless. And so that was my entry into Buddhism. I never really even thought of myself so much as a Buddhist, and I kind of barely think of myself as now quite as kept. Uh, I think of myself really kind of post-Buddhist, right? Because I'm, I'm still not invested in the beliefs. I'm invested in the practice that one can actually experience and say, oh, if I want to have a life in which I feel more comfortable and connected to the life that I have and to the people that, around me, that are around me, 
then I, can, I, I will practice relaxing into what is. And I had to do that in a more fierce way than I ever imagined when my grandfather died. And so for many of us that happens to be true, you kind of take on a practice or a spiritual tradition or something, and you think you're doing it, and you're, you think you're doing it, and then it turns out when something really hits the fan that it's doing you. And that's what happened for me with Zen practice. And that's where I fell in love with it because it was there to catch me and to help me make sense of a reality that I couldn't make and didn't want to make sense of. And so it gave me um, an opportunity through having developed practices to make my way through what was at that time the, you know, the most um, tragic and sad thing that happened for me in my life. It, made, it helped me to actually work through it so that I came out of it on the other side, not, I, I fell apart, right, but I wasn't broken. So I fell apart because that's what we do as human beings. Grief is necessary, important, and part of how we experience and make sense of life. But I came out on the other side of it feeling that I was actually more whole. I felt more connected to my grandfather. And I also felt that my overall relationship to the world around me was no longer fraught with one of just why is this not different, right? Why is this not different? What is going, what is wrong here, right? Those were, that's the way that I felt like, I suddenly began to feel that I fit in the world. And not because there was a belief system that told me, oh, you fit, but rather because I experienced a deep level of connectedness because I put aside the sense that the experience has to be altered to my liking at any given moment. Does that make sense? A little bit? So that's one of the things that exists for um, us here in, in American Buddhism is that meditation has kind of come as the practice that many of us have taken on. And I would say probably for that very same reason that we come from these different backgrounds. We're runaway Christians, we're runaway Catholics, we're runaway Jews, we're you know, wayward Baptists. We come from these different traditions that we don't necessarily um, entirely give up, or maybe some of us have given up on them. But Buddhism kind of, it's, it's sort of like having, um, you know, it's like you, you, you have someone that you're married to and then you have a lover and they're a really good lover and they, 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 they help you uh, make sense of things. And, and maybe they're not the lover you're gonna be with for the rest of your life, but they help you make sense of things in a way that your traditional marriage, your traditional relationship, your traditional family didn't entirely make sense for you. And so Buddhism, for me, and particularly meditation practice, was something that could coexist with my life. It didn't have, I didn't have to take something out of my life and leave it behind. I didn't have to leave my upbringing behind. I didn't have to leave my mixed race background behind. I didn't have to leave behind that I was queer. I didn't have to leave behind that I was female, that I was black, that I was anything. Right? I didn't have to leave anything behind because what the practice was saying is that what it's really about is just being with what is. And eventually I wrote a book about being with what is, and at that particular time, the what is t happened to be about being black. Right? And that book is a metaphor for any kind of being with what is, whether you're black, or whether you're queer, or whether you're fat, or whether you're skinny, or whether you think you're smart or stupid or better or less or all of those things, right? The, the being, being black's concept overall is a metaphor for the basic Buddhist teaching of how can we be with what is and find ourselves in that? How can we find ourselves in that? And so that's how I ended up deeply in the practice. And then one day I woke up and I realized, wow, the um, world is burning around me and this being with what is is pretty groovy, but there's a whole lot to do out there. 
And for me, which I think is probably different for many people that may have come from privileged backgrounds in which they didn't have to pay as much attention to the pressures of society, the challenges, whether those are economic challenges, whether those are challenges of uh, confronting issues of race, confronting issues of sexuality, confronting issues of gender. I had to face those because they were immediate and they were in front of me and being with what is meant facing those realities too. And that's one of the things that has been most powerful for me is to recognize that you have in this interesting practice that allows itself to morph, to really meet you where you are. What it does is allow, it, it then gives you the platform, if you will, to meet your life as it is and out of that, one feels rather than overwhelmed by all of the ways in which we're trying to make reality different, you feel this kind of deep sense of settling, like, oh, I can actually be with what is, and from there I can make changes. Because if you can't face something as it is, you actually can't begin to change it. If you can't be honest with the parts of yourself that you don't like that you wish you could hide that you feel like your friends are not or your family aren't going to accept then you can't either work with it to change it or to simply accept it and allow other people to work with you as you are so i got both of those things out of buddhism um, it's not the buddhism that's going to be in many ways it's gonna, not going to seem like the buddhism that's in your books but it is the buddhism that we are really rushing towards in contemporary society. We have the mindfulness movement that's opening up and um, what I would say is taking the, the, the very essence of the essence of the practice and putting it in a package that even further does not ask people to have to take on right, a Buddhist veneer in any way. And, and some people are challenged by that, but I think that, that it's actually a good thing. Because for me, any practice, any path that empowers us to return to ourselves, that gives us the permission to claim who we are fully and completely, is the most revolutionary practice for humanity that exists. Because when we find ourselves as human beings, what we find is that we're connected to all other human beings. Our sense of suffering and inability to cope or overwhelm and inability to face things is at least mitigated if not drops away. And it empowers us as a result to actually be useful in our society, to be available to change in our society, because we get to see both we are perfect as we are, and we can actually make change to the things that need to be changed. Uh, I think I'll stop there, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, I think that there are, there are um, what one would say, are universal truths, right, that just remain true and just like things that have been, that are true in our society, they, they, they change according to the time, right, and, and according to the time and, and the culture. And so each of those truths and how they get expressed as a teaching Right, so the core truths remain the same, right? That human beings, the, our lives are characterized by this sense of, gosh, I think things are not quite right, <laughs> right? Other, i.e., the term that's often used is suffering, but it's not a great translation of the, the true word. The true word is uh, dukkha, and dukkha means stuck wheel. It's kind of, its parts mean stuck wheel. So um, most of us, uh, well, if you ride a bicycle, you know what it's like to have a stuck wheel, right? That kind of like uh, frustration. 
And if you try to get on your bike and ride with that stuck wheel, the kind of wobbliness you experience, well, life is characterized by that on, on scales that are small and large. Um, so yeah, there are some core things that, say that stay the same. Luckily, Buddhists are all about being in the moment. And so we don't have to go back and teach people anything from last year because every teaching that is offered is skillful and what what that means to Buddhists is it's a teaching that's about the moment and what is needed for that moment and we don't get ourselves caught up in like what are you going to do in the future and how will that change because just as I will evolve so will the person so will the situation so will time just I mean we have Buddhists that have are coming out of historically patriarchal societies and that's needing to change too. And so there's always, and that's true not just of Buddhism, it's true of every tradition, that there are some core tenets and we look at them and we have to separate the dis difference between what was the culture at the time and what was the essence of the teachings. Yeah, I think that that's the nature of a decentralized spiritual tradition rather than a centralized one. So. That, that has a lot to do with it. There's a great deal of investment in the, um, right, the, the, the uh, institutionalization of the Catholic Church and many, many other traditions as well. And so uh, because of Buddhism's, Buddhism's history, it's always morphed. And so there's a lot more decentralization. There, certainly centralization exists but there is a lot more decentralization. And, and now that it's hit the West, it's even more decentralized than, ev than ever. It's kind of, yeah, I'll just tell you really briefly, like someone said to me when they were like, well, what does it mean to be a priest? And I was like, it depends on who you go and study with. Um, yeah, you know, I don't think that I had a bad experience. You, you go and you, you go shopping and you put on an outfit and the outfit doesn't fit, it just doesn't look good on you. Didn't look good on me, that's all. Uh, that might be a fantastic outfit on someone else and looks really good. Maybe they be, bell bottoms works for them. Bell bottoms makes me look too short. It, you know, it's just like it didn't fit. It, it wasn't so much that, and I could appreciate that outfit from afar. So I'm also ordained as an interfaith minister. And so I have great appreciation for Muslim tradition. I, I, fast, for the, I, I fast for Ramadan every year. Um, I have great appreciation for Christian tradition, for Jewish, all of the things. So what I've come to on the other side is not so much did I look at that and not, um, not uh, sort of give that a fair shot, but like I found something that fit for me. And frankly, I think that really what it comes to is I'm just not a believer. And, and, and so most of things that require, including where Buddhism wants it wants me to believe anything. I'm just not a, I'm not a believer. So I'm kind of still an agnostic, uh, you know, running around in Buddhist robes sometimes. But it's not a, um, you know, it, it's, it's not a uh, uh, reflection on the Christian tradition that though that outfit didn't suit me. I just think that we're in a fantastic time where we have an opportunity to not just take the clothes that were given to us, but to find the ones that really suit us and make us look fantastic. Yeah, you know, Buddhism is kind of fun that way because it, it, it really isn't asking much of you in terms of belief. You know, it's a kind of, it's a, it, it can be in its Western representation pretty, a little bit heady and so you kind of find your way in with like, yeah, I like this, I'm not really thinking so much about that. It doesn't ask much of you and if you're like, well, I'm going to take this but I'm not really into that, there's not a lot of, unless you're in a really, um, which, which isn't where you would start, like if you go and you're, you're you know, trying to be an ordained monk, it, it, it doesn't really ask much of you. It's a discovery-oriented um, proposition. It says, discover what works for you. I mean, and even the historic Buddha said, don't believe it just because I said it. Go and take it on, practice it, try it for yourself. And I don't think that my nature and constitution could have bought it if that wasn't part of this the essential idea because whenever something came up that I, I was like yeah I'm really not sure about that bowing thing I'm not really sure about that 
you know, it was too much incense, you know, whatever it was, I was like, oh, the deities, that's weird, like, you know, <laughs> all kinds of ideas. I could be like, okay, well, I'm going to put that aside. And as it were, you know, we, we unfold in a kind of maturity that's not about, that doesn't come to like, okay, and now I'm like all about deities, but what it does come to is I get what that's about and what it's speaking to, and I can see the value in that. And so I don't have to cut it off and run away from the whole thing just because that's not my particular, right? Like that's, that's not my dance, right? But I really appreciate, and in fact, it has allowed me to appreciate. Because in many ways, Buddhist aspects reflect almost all other spiritual traditions because they took up the other spiritual traditions and, and, and like it's, it's in the water. The essential thing that's different, I think, than most Western religions is this, um, and people would say like you know, theistic versus non-theistic. There's plenty of there's plenty of Buddhists that have at least a pantheon of of deities, and so it's not entirely non-theistic. Um, but the essential idea that we are we are all entirely connected, that we are interdependent is, is very distinct. That we come from a place of absolute, or some traditions would say basic goodness, and that we're already whole and as we are, rather than we have to aspire to become a, a, a kind of whole. That, that creates a little bit of a distinction. It's not a better, it's just an orientation of like what really resonates for people depending on their experience. So I would say, um, f go find the tradition or the practice that's the most sort of s stripped down in terms of like stuff, so that you can just get to the heart of it, because really what it's about is not about whether you find Buddhism or do Buddhism, it's really about do you find yourself. And insight meditation is great for that, by the way. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'll get, I'll get more prominent, yeah. and then it won't look like that. Um, you know, we're, we're in a patriarchal society, and so, you know, patriarchy represents itself in whatever thing that it, it touches. And um, in, the Jap in Japan, you know, it's a, it's a very strongly patriarchal society th through our history. Much of Asian societies are, and so you see, for sure, a strong... Um, the, the evidence of that, right, in, in terms of like who, ha, who has been promoted and that kind of thing. And, and in Japan in particular where Zen, and there, there are other, there's Chan, right, which is China, which is, they say Chinese Zen, which is really a bad way to say it. And there's Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition, which is Vietnamese Zen, which is really, it's like a mix, mixing things up. But for the sake of ease, you would say that, right? So Vietnamese flavor of Zen, Chinese flavor of Zen is, you know, Chan. Um, you know, in, in Japan, temples pass from father to son, right? That, that was the nature of the society. So Buddhism took on the nature of the society that it found itself in. In the West, particularly because of the time and, and, and what it landed into was like, you know, uh, a lot more freedom for women and women demanding it. You don't actually see it as overtly, but of course it's there, right? It's there because there are men that control the media, and who do they choose when they put somebody on the cover of a magazine? But the fact is, there is more female practitioners than anything else. The other thing is that Zen is a very young male, young male energy, right? It's, it's, it's practice orientation as it came is very organized around um, taming the energy of young men, because that's largely who was in the monasteries. That's very different now in, in the West, and so there's a lot of art and creativity and feminine expression, so it, it really is open to, to finding someone that resonates for you, and, and it will work. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, um, but um, please uh, join me in thanking our guest speaker today.